Greetings and welcome to Fellowship in the Word. This is Assistant Pastor Earl Carter and it's good to be with you once again. Today I'd like to talk with you just briefly about a topic that we're all familiar with. Grace, G-R-A-C-E, grace. And we're familiar with the scriptures and how the Bible tells us that by grace you are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And we look at grace as being defined in, in a very simplistic manner. And we say grace is God's unmerited favor. And, and I, I would agree with that. However, I want to look at grace from a different perspective, just a little bit today. If you have your Bibles, go with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to look at the very last verse in this passage. That is 2 Peter chapter 3, and that is verse number 18. And he says here, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Grace. Grow in grace. I, 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 as I was thinking about this, I, it hit me that, okay, we're saved by grace, but there's also a grace on the life of an individual. And, and, and so God did not just save us just to save us. That is, we have to grow in this grace that Peter is talking about. And I want to read to you just a few words that I, I, I gathered together concerning grace. And it, it's defined as the kindness by which God exerts his holy influence upon man's spirit. He turns him to Christ, keeps him, strengthens him, increases him in the faith, knowledge, affection, and ignites him to the exercising of godly virtues. I'll read it again. The kindness by which God exerts his holy influence upon man's spirit turns him to Christ, keeps, strengthens, increases him in the faith, knowledge, affection, and ignites him to exercising of godly virtues. And there, there, there are several scriptures that deals with man's heart as it applies to grace. And in Jeremiah 31.3, the scriptures tells us, with thy loving kindness have I drawn thee. And in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse number 44, Jesus himself said, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. That is, this is the kindness of God exerting his holiness, his holy influence on man to draw him to himself. And I love what Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27. He says that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. And so God deals with man. He is pulling man and drawing man towards this grace. And if you'll go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I want to read this scripture. This is what the Apostle Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 10. He says this, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And, and, and that reminds me that God's grace has called every believer, every child of God, according to Romans chapter 12, we have been given gifts. Okay, and, and these gifts we have to operate in according to the grace. You see, Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And, and he would speak this often in his letters to, to the churches. In fact, you know, we see this in Corinth. He had issues with the Corinthian church because they questioned his position as an apostle. And he would relate and he would say, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God. Now, this is a grace that has been given to Paul. 
This grace as an apostle, the same grace that was given to Peter and John and James. But, but Paul is saying, I, I have to let you know that this grace I received not of men, but it came from Jesus and by the will of God. He would say that in both his letters to the Corinthian church. He would also say that to the Galatian church and to the Ephesian church. He would say, as Paul, an apostle by Jesus Christ and God. And so he's speaking about the grace that has been given to him to lead the churches. And we'll see him, his influence as leading the churches in a few moments. But grace, grace. Peter said, grow in grace. So this requires a discipline to grow in the grace that God has bestowed upon each believer as he has placed him in the body. It requires a discipline. Number one, if you go over to Psalms chapter one, we can quote this, but let's go there and read the scriptures together. Psalm one, verses one through two. We'll read one and two. And the scripture says, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. So number one, as far as this grace, growing in this grace, we must eliminate hindrances to spiritual nutrition. We must eliminate hindrances to spiritual nutrition. And one of these ways is to be aware and to discern the company that you keep. Okay. He says here in the Psalms, he says, blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. That is one that does not seek out information, counsel, direction, instruction by the ungodly, because it's going to lead you in a path of death. He says, nor nor seek out or and stand in the way of sinners because when you're standing with these individuals, it's going to cause you not to operate in the grace of God. Let's go back over to Peter. In fact, let's go to 1 Peter now. We were in 2 Peter. Let's go to 1 Peter and we'll look at chapter 2. So number one, to, to move in the grace of God and to grow in the grace, number one, we need to eliminate those hindrances to spiritual nutrition. The second thing that we need to consider is also not keeping certain types of company. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and we'll look at verses 1 through 3. That will be 1 Peter chapter 2 and we'll look at the first three verses. We have to eliminate those hindrances to spiritual nutrition. OK, the first thing we looked at in Psalms one is eliminating bad company, individuals that would hinder our walk. But right here, Peter tells us something that we must do that will aid us in developing and growing in grace. Verse number one says, wherefore, lay aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. Then he says in verse two, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Notice the placement of that verse. Before that desire is there, he says, you need to eliminate this malice. You need to eliminate those things that will prohibit you from getting spiritual nutrition. And, and so this, grace that we are to grow in, we are to establish the fact that we must lay some things aside. Over in the book of Hebrews in chapter 12, it tells us that also. It says that we need to lay aside every sin and weight that so easily besets us. And in Hebrews it says lay aside sin, but it also said weights. Okay, weights may not necessarily be a sin, but it's something that you can carry that is undue and unnecessary that can hinder your walk. 
Um, I was laughing the other day with, you know, watching my little grandson, and he's all excited about traveling, and he's about to go on a trip. And so he's packing his bag. He's packing his backpack, and he wants to put everything in there, all of his toys, and he pulls out five from his little library. He pulls out five books and puts them in his backpack, and that is a weight. And so I had to say to him, say, all right, this is too heavy. Feel that. He can, he can hardly hold that thing. And so the picture is he's weighted down with all of these things that are not necessary for the trip that he is about to take. And so it is with Christians. Sometimes we weigh ourselves down with things that are unnecessary that will hinder our growing in the grace the ability that God has given to us to exercise for the church. So we need to eliminate different things that would hinder our growing in the grace of God. One thing about grace that I, I found out, and go with me to the book of Titus. You know, grace teaches us. Grace instructs us, and God wants us to see that. And this is a part of growing in grace. Go to Titus chapter 2, verse number 11. And this is what Paul says to him. He says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. I love that. This grace. Now, he's talking about salvation, grace. But grace is grace. And he says, not only has it appeared to all men, verse 12 says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly. Okay, so right here we see grace trains us. Grace instructs us. This is why Peter said, grow in this grace because even though yesterday we were at a place of growth in the Lord, today we still need new mercies. Today we need to continue to advance in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to continue to advance in the grace that God has given us. This is why when he says that for teachers, understand that you must be diligent to teach the word of God with all truth because you're going to receive a greater judgment. Teachers must continue to learn. Those that are instructing others must continue to learn. In fact, Paul told Timothy, he said, Timothy, be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ because you as a young pastor, you are teaching others that are supposed to be positioned based on your teaching that they may teach others. So there is this perpetual instruction in the grace of God from one individual to the next individual. So it impacts the entire body. But we see right here that Paul is telling Titus that the grace of God instructs us on how to live. It teaches us to, to live ungodly and that reminds me of how we interact with one another because of this grace. It is this grace. Paul went on to tell the Corinthian church, and this is important. He says, the grace of God that was operating in me was not in vain. Too many Christians allow the grace of God, and, and they allow it to become vain to them because they do not accept it. They do not accept the grace that is on one individual's life to deposit in their lives. This is why the scripture says to obey those that have rule over you for they watch over your souls. And there are times in, in some ministries, in some churches that as the pastor is giving out instruction, the word of God becomes non effect in the lives of those that are hearing because they don't receive the grace that's on that individual's life to deposit the truth of the scriptures into their hearts that they would navigate these last days and these events. We are supposed to walk soberly, he says right here, soberly, righteously, and godly where? In this present world. And so God has given us pastors that are grace to understand the times that we're living in. When Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus and he said, see that you then walk circumspectly concerning these times that you're living in. That means to walk in awareness of the conditions of the world 
according to the grace of God that has been deposited in you. Walk in that grace, he says, the grace of God. So not only was Paul what he was because of the grace of God, but every believer is what they are in Christ because of the grace of God. He's called some to be pastors and teachers and some to be called evangelists. The scriptures tells us we, we are told that there are individuals that are teachers. That is the grace of God. Go with me to Ephesians chapter four. We're going to look at a, a passage of scripture. So the grace of God teaches us that we must live soberly. That means we need to walk and live with a sound mind in this present age. When the world says it's time to, to get out and raise up a riotous attitude and to go out and to pick it and to, 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 to have all these demonstrations, well, the child of God's demonstration is going to be prayer. Because God said, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways and pray, God says, then I will hear from heaven. Meaning God will move when we avail ourselves to prayer. Because that's given to us as a weapon, hallelujah, to, to get God involved in what's going on around in our situation. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, the scriptures tells us, and we're still talking about the grace of God. And, and, and God wants the grace to be productive in our lives. And we're going to go back to Paul in a second. But he, he wants that grace to be productive in our lives. The scriptures tells us, verse number 14. He says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lay wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. Let me pause right there. He says we are compacted together. We are put together as a body and God has placed us together in this body and therefore as we are together as one body, we must receive from the individual part their grace that God has given to them. According to Romans chapter 12, those gifts. And they operate through the grace. That is that ability of God that's going to operate in them. His holiness to influence them, to inspire them by God's spirit to cause us to grow. To cause us to receive what they are bringing to the body. Because in verse 16 he goes on to say, by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, look at that, the measure of every part makes increase of the body unto edifying of itself in love. And, and so now Paul is saying, okay, the grace that is given is to cause the body to build itself up. How many times are you missing Missing in action when the body is being edified because of the grace of God that's given to someone that is going to exhort the church. When someone is speaking of, of God's graciousness and they're speaking of, of God to exhort the church to give praise to the Lord. And, you know, this, this giving praise to the Lord, God said, I will inhabit the praises of his people. And so when we are exhorted or you have an exhorter that is encouraging the congregation to lift up holy hands to God without wrath and without doubting, and they are giving their part, they are utilizing the grace as an exhorter to exhort the congregation to give God some praise. And so he's inhabiting that praise based on the grace that's given to one to exhort. And so God wants us to understand and look at this grace that not only trains us on how to live righteously and holy, but God is saying we need to receive that grace that is given because if you reject it, then you make it vain in your life. 
Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're still talking about grace. And, and, and God's word is inexhaustible. Okay, God gives us various revelations and understandings of his word. And we can look at the various dimensions and definitions of God explaining himself or God revealing truth to us. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 1, Paul says this. We then as workers together with him. Beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. He's saying that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Okay, and he's in context, he is confronting the church at Corinth because they were not receptive to him and he had to correct them. And this is again why early on he said, Paul, an apostle, not of men, but of Jesus Christ by the will of God and he said listen let me explain some things to you my apostleship and he goes on to say if we go over to verse number four he says but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience in afflictions in necessities in distresses in stripes, and he's listing all of these things that he has persevered through as an apostle of God for them to understand and to receive the grace that he has for them. He goes on in verse 6, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true. All of these things he's persevered through, being called a deceiver, but yet he's true to the gospel. By honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers yet true as unknown yet well known as dying and behold we live as chastened and not killed as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich as having nothing and yet possessing all things and he's correcting the church later also in their relationships because they received individuals that he would later say be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. And so now we see the grace that is given to the apostle to bring correction to the church at Corinth. And so they needed to receive this instruction that they may grow thereby. And so sometimes we, we say, okay, the grace of God, the grace of God as it pertains to salvation, the grace of God as it pertains to what God has called each of us as an individual to perform, but what about the grace that God has given to another to bring about correction and instruction to us? Okay? And, and so Paul is telling the church there, I don't want your, this grace to be in vain. And so now you have to bring about some correction in your conduct and in your behavior. Now this grace that is a part of Paul's life. Now, for him to get to where he is, let's go over to Philippians chapter 3. Because now this grace that we're talking about, it requires a prominence of effort. A prominence of effort. That is, it needs to be uppermost in our thinking, okay, to get to this point. Because, see, we are ever growing in the grace of God. And the Apostle Paul, as great as this man was, he was not content with where he was in Christ. That is, he wanted to continue to grow fully beyond where he was. And we see this in Philippians chapter 3. Let's start at verse number 10. Wow. And get the thought here. He says that I may know him, speaking about Jesus, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He says, not as though I had attained already. 
either were already perfect. Okay. He says, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ. He says, number one, I have not achieved perfection. Okay, he was not content with where he was in his growth. He says, I've not attained perfection, but, but I'm looking for something. I'm looking towards something I, I want to apprehend. And in verse number 13, he says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. So now he's saying all the things that I've gained, I'm moving on, especially those things from the natural. Because Paul began to tell them, he said, listen, you know, I could boast in the natural things of this life, of this world, of these accomplishments. He says, I, I was of the tribe of Benjamin, meaning the very favorite son of Jacob the father. Okay, he said, I, 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 was, I, I was a Pharisee amongst the Pharisees in the religious circles of the world. He said, I was in the highest echelon of those men that were educated in the laws of Moses and in the laws of men. He said, I was above all that, but he said, I count that as done because I'm going to press towards something that is greater than that. I'm going to press to perfection. I, I want this grace that I have to go to another level. I want this grace that I have that God has given me I want it to be more like Jesus which is why he says I press toward the mark and, and, and that term that he's using is, is, is an athletic term and of a runner who, who is stretching to get across that finish line and, and so now we see here that he is saying that this, this grace is of importance that I want it fully developed in me. I want it to get developed even stronger in men inside of me. Therefore, I am pressing. That means he is stretching himself as far as he can go in the picture that he is painting as a, a runner that is stretching to get across the finish line. And, and Paul is saying, I press toward that mark. And so that mark is the prize of the high calling of God, the high calling of God that's in Christ Jesus. That high calling is that grace that has been given to him on behalf of the churches. Okay, he pressed. Now, go back to chapter 1 of Philippians. And we'll close on this here. Philippians chapter 1. And so, Paul says this, verse 21. He says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I what not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. He is saying, I'm in a place now where I can go home to be with Jesus. I want to be with Jesus. But now in his mind and in his heart is understanding the grace that's placed on his life for the church. And so he says, a part of me desires to depart with and be with Jesus. However, verse number 24, he says, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. That is, it's more needful for you. And that is for me, Paul, to fulfill the calling of the grace of God on my life for the church to instruct you, to cause you to walk circumspectly, to cause you to walk in the knowledge of God. And he says, verse number 25, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you. Look at that. This man is saying, okay, I recognize the grace on my life. Part of me wants to go and be with Jesus. But the grace on my life is pulling so hard that I desire to fulfill this grace, which is a benefit for the churches of Jesus Christ. So now, my friend, I would ask you, where are you concerning the grace that is on your life?
Have you positioned yourself to receive the grace that God has placed in an individual over your life? Have you positioned yourself to yield to that grace that you may further rejoice in the things of God? My prayer is that you receive that grace that God has not only given to you, but you also are receptive to the grace that God has given to an individual that is over you, your pastor, your leader, your elder, the minister that is giving you the truth of the gospel. Amen. Well, my time has expired for this time, and I want to thank you for joining us for Fellowship in the Word. This has been Assistant Pastor Earl Carter. May the Lord bless you. May you walk in his grace in Jesus' name. We appreciate your continued support. If you would like to make a donation or pay your tithes and offering, please go to tbwc.org slash give. We have begun our Moving People in the Right Direction pledge campaign, and $12 is all it takes to help us to purchase and complete the construction of our building. Your donation can be made at tbwc.org. Join us every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. online or on Facebook. It is our pleasure to introduce our new online Christian education program, the Believer's Bible Institute. Registration is now open for individuals interested in furthering their knowledge of the Word of God. Please visit bbitbwc.com for more information and to view our current course offerings. Jesus said, come unto me. Join us for prayer every Friday at 7 p.m. You can submit a prayer request by emailing us at prayer at tbwc.org.